So I'm going to be switching things up a little bit. We've been hearing a lot about from the theory side of things, and I think the talks after me are also theory side of things, but my talk is purely observational, and I hope this is okay, but it's actually pretty much non-radio, which I know is not most of you guys. <laughs> so most of my talk is going to be kind of a, a summary of previous searches that have been done, looking for FRBs at other counterparts, as well as a bit of a discussion on the current limits and sensitivities for some of the instruments that are available. With the caveat that this is certainly not an exhaustive list, uh, so I've tried to choose just a representative summary of papers, or else I could be here all day. And also, since I am making so many references, I've decided to leave all my most uh, most of my citations to, to, uh, for the end on their own slide. I believe these talks will be available online later, so if you want more information, that will be there. Okay, so starting off, most of you are probably aware that, or have heard the story that the current state of FRBs is remarkably similar to that um, in the early days of GRBs back in the 80s and the 90s. Um, in the beginning, GRBs had only been observed by gamma ray observatories, and so it took a while to confirm that they were actually a truly cosmological source. Um, that's because gamma ray observatories have notoriously bad localization abilities. So even though, like FRBs, GRBs were isotropically distributed on the sky, they couldn't actually confirm uh, how far away they actually were coming from. Unlike GRBs, we have been able to localize at least a couple FRBs, as we've been hearing about yesterday. But like GRBs, if we really want to have a real hope of understanding what is actually going on inside of the FRB, and if we really want to be able to localize not just some, but all FRBs, then we really need to find a counterpart at a, a, a wavelength other than radio. OK. Now, the word counterpart is quite vague. I think it means different things depending on who you ask. So I'm going to give you my definition on what I am considering a counterpart, at least for this talk. First off, I'm only considering electromagnetic counterparts, so I won't be talking about gravitational waves or neutrinos, for example. And obviously, a counterpart should be coming from at least the same general direction as an FRB. Of course, this can be difficult to do because many instruments can have, uh, or at least you know, for a single dish radio instruments, they can have pretty wide range of uh, uh, error regions. And thirdly, you must be able to robustly rule out the possibility that any new transient that you find could be coming from literally anything other than an FRB. And this is much easier said than done in practice. And I also think you can break down the word counterpart into three subcategories. You can have a prompt one, which is, of course, contemporaneous. At the same time you see an FRB, you see some kind of signal at another wavelength. You could have a delayed signal. It could be This is something that's probably related to something like a, an afterglow. This could be anywhere from hours to days after you see the FRB. And there's a third type, which is more like a long-lived associated source that's uh, just coming from the same environment as the FRB. Uh, I will only be talking mostly about the first type, but also the second one, as I believe the third type is going to be more relevant this afternoon in the FRB environments talk. All right, so let's get started. Let's start with a very high energy, so this is like TEV type energy range. There have been several instruments that have already done these searches. I've listed just a few of them here. Uh, these instruments are capable of going down to about microsecond timescale resolution, depending on your instrument. Um, the issue here is that most of these have relatively smaller fields of view, so it can be difficult to do a truly prompt search for an FRB counterpart. In fact, most of these instruments have had delayed times of uh, at least a couple to several hours. The exception, of course, is the Large Area Telescope on Fermi, which is space-based, and it has a very large field of view, so it is an excellent tool for doing these kind of real-time prompt counterpart searches. Most of these previous works have found an upper limit on the luminosity of about 10 to the 47, 10 to the 49, ergs per second, but most theories predict very faint, if any, counterparts at these very high energy TeV um, energies, and that's illustrated here in this image. So you have, uh, in this SED, 
you have the upper limits coming from uh, the lat and magic compared to two different objects. So this is Sag A star and the Crab Nebula. If these two objects were instead originating at the distance of FRB 121102, which is about one gigaparsec. And there's some scaling going on for the extragalactic background, uh, background light, et cetera. Uh, clearly, you can see that these two instruments are not sensitive enough to detect at least these types of counterparts. And that, that's, that's pretty much true for all of the instruments. Now, the, in the gamma ray and X-ray energies, you have the burst alert telescope from SWIFT and the gamma ray burst monitor from Fermi. These are both really nice tools for doing prompt follow-up because they have very large fields of view, so you have a good chance of just accidentally catching an FRB when it goes off. Uh, they have pretty good time resolution, and they already have the framework in place to do these kinds of rapid transient follow-up because they already do it for GRBs, and they do it very well for GRBs. So these instruments are really best for the kind of survey-style FRB prompt searches, but also in this energy range you have instruments like Chandra and XMM-Newton. These are really better for the more pointed follow-up of FRBs that have already been localized, so you know, mostly the repeating FRBs, because they have much smaller fields of view, but they can be capable of getting much deeper limits. Uh, it's a trade-off. And this has obviously been done many times for 121102, for example, which is where this uh, data set is coming from. So we can place limits on the amount of energy that could potentially be extracted from an FRB if we make some uh, assumptions about how the flux is behaving from the FRB, if we assume you know, maybe some kind of inverse square law for the flux. It's very simple. And previous papers have found limits of about 10 to the 46, 10 to the 47 ergs for X-ray and gamma ray, respectively. And this can allow us to place constraints on how far out we could expect to see an FRB counterpart. Um, if we assume, you know, for specific models, we assume how much energy we can expect to receive. For example, this is for a magnetar. So this level is approximately the maximum amount of energy you could possibly expect to come out of a magnetar. This is a very vague number. I know all you theorists are probably <laughs> judging me for this. Uh, and then this is the distance of 121102. These are the observed fluences, uh, assuming that inverse square law in this hatched region represents basically the part of parameter space where an FRB could possibly live. Uh, so this is, like I said, a very simple calculation you can do. There has been one proposed counterpart to an FRB. This is for 131104. Now, this signal was seen at the very edge of the bat's field of view. It was so far on the edge of the field of view that, in fact, only about 3% of the bat's detectors would have been sensitive to a signal at this location. And in practice, any signal that has less than 10% we call it the partial coding fraction. Anything that has less than 10% is usually immediately thrown out and not considered because you have such a high rate of noise contamination at those edges. Uh, and like I said, this was at 3%. And this is something that myself and my advisor, Brad Sanko, and other members of the BAT team have been looking into. And we, we really do think that this is probably just noise because we tried some different methods of calculating the significance of this signal. And this is one example. Uh, we've broken down the field of view by quadrant light curves. And as you can see, we find a much lower significance here for this signal. And you would expect, if this was a real signal, that that high significance should be independent of the method used to calculate that. But this is not published yet, so. All right. Optical instruments. Uh, can be quite varied in their abilities. I've listed a couple that have done previous searches, but generally they have really nice large fields of view. So again, you have a good chance of catching an FRB. You can do those truly prompt searches. Uh, but the, one of the issues here is that they usually have pretty crowded backgrounds. You can see in this image, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. So even if you do identify a new transient, that has appeared at the same time and location as an FRB, it can be very hard to definitively prove that that transient is actually 
the FRB and not just some background supernova. One of the nicer instruments for doing optical follow-ups is possibly TESS. TESS is space-based and it has a very large field of view. And it actually did serendipitously observe an FRB recently, 1812-28. Uh, and here's its light curve. You can see there's clearly no jump. Uh, the blue line is the FRB time. But this is not surprising because even TESS is not sensitive enough to detect the expected counterparts. But this is very model dependent, of course. Um, but if FRBs are as close as some are thought to be on the order of you know, tens of megaparsecs, then TESS theoretically should be sensitive enough to see some kind of optical counterpart. So maybe in the future, it will be even luckier and catch one of the near FRBs. Uh, I won't spend much time on the radio interferometers because we already heard some very nice talks yesterday on a couple of these examples. Um, there are many, many of these. I couldn't even list them all. Um, I'll just say, you know, they're, they're capable of doing very fast time searches, uh, and they can do much better localization than the traditional single-dish radio instruments. And one nice aspect of this is that they have a much lower background usually than the optical, so maybe it's a better method for searching for counterparts in hosts than in the optical. Um, and this is a very nice plot I stole from Terrenay's paper because it does a really nice job of comparing the sensitivity limits and the ability to localize. R is the region to which an FRB could be localized. And this is for both interferometers and single-dish instruments. So the horizontal lines are the sensitivity limits, and here's the capability to localize an FRB. I've just included that for reference. I thought it was nice. Um, again, I won't speak too much on this. It's really not my expertise. You guys are all know this much better than me, probably. So there was one counterpart proposed in the radio. This was for 150418. Uh, immediately after the FRB went off, it was observed with the ATCA, and there was a transient scene that faded over the course of a few days. Uh, was presumed to be associated with the FRB, but then was reobserved later and was seen to brighten, so it's thought to be more likely to be an unrelated AGN. So while maybe that's not so very interesting, the case itself was one of the first really nice examples of rapid multi-wavelength follow-up of an FRB using several different instruments. And as I've been mentioning in all my previous slides, all these instruments, all these energy waves, uh, uh, ranges, they all have their limits. And as we've been hearing from all these theory talks, we don't always exactly know what we expect to see for a counterpart. So of course, the best method to use is of course, getting everything you can get your hands on. And so <laughs> there have been several nice examples of people doing this. I've listed just a few of them here. <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, as I said, I have a slide of all my references that I've cited here, if you would like that. And I thought I would finish by just pointing out a couple open-ended questions that might be useful for the discussion session later. Uh, how can we improve the collaboration between the FRB detection and the other instruments at other wavelengths doing the follow-up? Um, you know, is it better to do a smaller dedicated mission that follows the radio field of view, or do we want to do something like GRBs, where they do TOO type follow up? Uh, and we, we've heard from some people yesterday from the instruments talk, they uh, have some ideas of, of rapidly putting out, you know, when an FRB is detected, but I, I think that's very instrument specific, I believe. And so it might be nicer to do something, again, like the GRB, GCN notices where it's one source. You just, it blasts everybody out every time there's a GRB, no matter who detects the GRB. Um, also, what should we be looking for in the next generation telescopes? And also just the big question, why aren't we seeing counterparts? I don't think anybody expected we'd make it this long without seeing one. Uh, is it really just a sensitivity issue? Is it a field of view issue? Or is there perhaps something uh, deeper going on that we maybe don't understand yet. And that's all I have. Thank you.